Hello and welcome to an introduction video to oscillators. In this video we will be looking at the kinds of oscillators that we get. We will look at some stability theory in the process of how do we go about creating some oscillators. Then feedback types, Barkhausen's criteria for oscillations and then the difference of selecting BJT or MOS circuits versus op amps to build your oscillators. So the pros and cons. Okay, so oscillator types. We get linear oscillators that typically has an amplifier of some negative feedback to stabilize your gain, and then it will use some form of resonance in a frequency selective network to choose the oscillation frequency. And this is typical, a positive feedback network. So, in terms of oscillation, we need to satisfy Barkhausen's criterion. Okay, so there is some criteria that needs to be met for us to build an oscillator. So we will be looking at the maths of this um, later in the video. Okay, but most of these linear oscillators are a bit unstable and we need to control the amplitude of these circuits to keep them um, stable. So, linear oscillators is typically for sinusoidal wave generation and in this video series what we will be looking at is the wind bridge, the phase shift, some LC tuned um, oscillators and the crystal tuned oscillator or the Pierce um, oscillator. Right, then we get some non linear oscillators, which is typically an amplifier of some positive feedback. In that criteria, we have a stable and mono stable multi vibrator. And these non-linear oscillators is typically used for square wave generation, triangle generation. And we build this using triggers and bistable circuits, which is typically a switching or memory element of some kind. So if you combine memory element and a trigger, we get the triple five dimer IC. So we will also be looking at how to use the trip five IC or understanding the internal workings of a trip five. And lastly, you get some waveform shaping circuits which can convert, say, squared waves to triangles and triangles to sinusoidals. But this is an old method to do it, just use a, a linear oscillator to, to do that if you need a sine wave. But in example, you can take a, a squared wave to triangle wave, which is one of the oscillators that we will be doing, is when we integrate the squared wave to get the triangle. So that is a form of wave shaping. Or if you put a, a triangle wave through a low pass filter or a high Q filter, you can also get out a sinusoidal waveform. Okay, so not particularly going to do a video on waveform shaping um, at any point soon. Okay. So, let's start with the linear oscillators and have a look at stability theory. Okay, if we add an LC component in a circuit, we add poles. Okay, so the moment that we add poles is they can be on the left hand side or on the right hand side. Okay, so if you put a step response into a system that have poles on the left hand side, if it's a bit unstable, the instability will fade away. It will go whoosh, gone. 
Okay? But if you are on the right hand plane, the system will spin out of control. Okay, so instability, saturation, in terms of mechanical systems, something will break or jump out of a building. Okay, so the area that we are interested in is right between the left hand and right and plane. Okay, and that is where we get oscillations. So this is when a signal is, or the system is, marginally stable. Okay, so to get the system to start up and create oscillations, we need to push it into the unstable side to get our oscillation starting. But to bring it under control, we need to push it into the stable side. So we will be playing around this line right here because no system is perfect and we can't have something sitting exactly on this line right here without some form of intervention. Okay, so this brings us to feedback types. Negative feedback you should know by now. This is to stabilize the gain of a system or to stabilize the frequency or whatever. So this is typically a resistive network that is in a negative feedback kind of setup. Okay, so you can have input signal, it gets amplified, you get an output, and a portion of that output is subtracted from the input. So technically making the input to our amplifier smaller. Okay, so this is how stability is being achieved. Okay, so that is why negative feedback is popular to stabilize systems. Positive feedback is an unstable system. Okay, so this beta network here is typically your RLC network, LC or RC, whatever kind that you will be using in here. And we will make use of positive feedback. Or if it's a negative amplifier, this system should ensure that there is a 180 degree shift so that the feedback becomes positive. Okay, so for oscillator, we do want the instability of the system. Right, so in terms of positive feedback, what happens is you will insert a signal and it will get amplified. Then a portion of this is fed back and added to the original, making the input to the amplifier larger in terms increasing the output. And you can see how this will just spin out of control and the system will become unstable. Okay, so here we have that typical right hand plane. Um, behavior where here we can have a typical left-hand plane behavior. Okay, so we need a mixture between these two. So a typical system, especially with an oscillator, going back to the circuit, with an oscillator we don't want to have input for our system to start up. Okay, so we will throw the input away any noise in the positive feedback system will cause this to spin out of control in any case at the frequency selective um, networks um, frequency. Okay, so the negative feedback that we have is to stabilize the gain of this amplifier or to give us the choice of a gain required. Okay, so Barkhuizen's criteria will have some form of gain that we need to employ for our system to oscillate. And down here we have our frequency selective network, which is our unstable part. So that part of playing tightrope with the two stable and unstables is by having positive and negative feedback in a system.
Okay, so Barkhausen's criteria say that to be on that center line, my assumption here is that this amplifier is already stabilized, and we want this output, uh, sorry, this input to be gone or zero for this system to start oscillating on its own. So Barkhausen's criteria says that the loop gain here should be equal to one. Okay, so if a loop gain is 1, it means that the output will not increase, not decrease, but remain kind of at the same amplitude with a phase shift of 0. Okay, so it means that this frequency selective network shouldn't suddenly make our feedback negative. Okay, so the moment that our feedback becomes negative, our oscillation will die out. Okay, and the gain should be one so that it does not become too large. Okay, so for Barkhausen, our gain multiplied by our frequency selective network should yield one with a zero phase shift. Okay, so when designing, this is what we are looking for. Okay, so if we assume that this input is zero, looking at this circuit, our feedback networks has the input x zero and the output xf. This, um, so xf is beta times x zero, and for our amplifier, x zero is xf multiplied by the gain. Okay, and if we multiply A and beta, we should end up with A if beta is equal to 1. Okay, so assuming negative feedback has already been applied to this amplifier to stabilize the gain. Okay, so that is Barkhausen's criterion. We will be looking at the actual implementation of this in the Winebridge oscillator and the Colpitts and Hartley. So if you want to see any mathematics on how this is done, it will be in some of the following videos. Okay, so, but first you need to understand what Barkhausen's criteria actually want from you. Okay, so, Going about choosing if you should use a BJT or op-amp implementation is the following considerations. Transistor amplifiers for these are typically complicated designs with a bit more components. Okay, but you can achieve much higher frequency designs when using a single BJT or MOSFET versus op-amp. Okay, op-amp has um, typically a lot of BJTs and MOSFETs in them, so lower gain bandwidth product. So for higher frequency oscillators, op-amp will not work, or the op-amp will be extremely expensive. So it can become a costly um, exercise. Okay. The BJT MOS implementation is more cost efficient for large scale productions. Okay, if some of the components cost a couple of cents, where a single op amp can cost a couple of rands. Okay, for the American people, dollars. So, yeah. A nice high bandwidth op amp can be quite pricey. So something that you don't want for large-scale productions. Okay, BJT and MOS implementations, you can do single rail. And these are also low noise implementations, where if you go to op-amps, they can be noisy. And the design process is easier if you use dual rail systems. So 
if it's a toy or something and it you only have one battery uh single rail versus dual rail most people will opt for the single rail implementation i'm not saying it's impossible to do dual rail for the op amps but it's something that you typically want to avoid okay so yeah the op amps the design is simple and they work for lower frequencies up to 100 kilohertz due to gain bandwidth uh, product issues and slew rate of op amps and that is it for the introduction to oscillators and how to choose what kind of implementation you will be going for so thank you for watching and see you in the next video